<laughs> Hi, Paris. Hi there. So let's chat a little bit about this upcoming workshop that you'll be presenting in Arlington, Massachusetts, calling it Refining Your Touch. Could you talk a little bit about why you've chosen the eyes and the spine to work on refining your touch? I've been talking to many practitioners and their question comes back to, I want to touch in the way that I felt that or heard that Moshe used to touch with invisible hands. And we're all looking towards that goal. And I think you don't stop trying to refine your touch until you're ready not to touch anybody anymore and go and join Moshe wherever he's hanging out now. So refining the touch is a lifelong quest for a Feldenkrais practitioner. Working with everything you want to have your touch refined, but I chose the eyes and the spine because those are two of the most potent places to work with a person. And we will actually be touching the closed eyeballs in this workshop. And I use touching in an ATM that we'll do, I use touching the eyeballs on yourself as, a, as the first step in really learning what a gentle but clear touch can be in your fingers and hands shoulders, spine, pelvis, the rest of you. And the eyes and the spine developed early on in you when you were learning to move. First, you got the control of the eyes. The eyes sent the messages to all the musculature along the back of your neck and down your spine to say, oh, if we do this, we need to tonify this side of the spine and the musculature will help us shift our weight, shift our weight in gravity. And you all did the lessons in your trainings about shifting weight and how you feel that shift of weight when you merely move the eyes. And you can do this also with somebody in FI. And the ultimate idea behind using the eyes and the spine and having an awareness in FI is that you can help a person to really find the, the initiation of any action that you want to have with your limbs, with your arms and your legs. Because if it doesn't start with the eyes, the spine, the pelvis, you don't have that support of the big muscles of the back and the spine. You just do a little bit of work with the eyes in ATM or FI, and it has a profound result. Mm -hmm. But sometimes people cannot move their eyes, say if they've had a brain injury or something else, and this is another way to have a handle into the nervous system to restore that function or to clarify it for somebody who is already moving their eyes, but they don't know it. There's this question that I have, and I think a lot of people have, about uh, how do we as practitioners relate differently and adapt our touch to different people. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, it's something that you're always going to be looking at, as I said before. And I have four, I've clarified it into four subcategories in refining the touch. And there may be more, maybe we'll discover them together in this workshop. But I think of them as pressure, range, speed, and trajectory. And if you want to remember that, it's PRST or first. Mm -hmm. Right? So pressure is how much force do you need to do? And you do need to use some force, right? There is caloric activity and contraction happening in your hands when you are rolling a head or lifting a shoulder, right? So you have to decide if it's going to be this much or that much, right? When you're lifting somebody's shoulder. Where does it feel easy to move? Where is it not so easy to move? And how do you stop before it gets not easy anymore? So that's how much work you have to do. How much pressure do you do? And then you have to figure out the range, which is very connected, of course, to the pressure. 
right? But if something moves easily, you don't have to change how much pressure. So something that you're probably familiar with when you roll a head, obviously you could probably apply more pressure and make the head go further, right? But you become sensitive to, oh, uh, right there, at that point, I have to exert more pressure to get him to move. And I don't want to do that. So that's that. The range is that it's the subcategory under pressure of like, that's the easy range. After that range, I have to apply too much pressure and I overcome the, the individual's tendency to be pulling back the other way. So that's those two, the pressure and the range. And then there is something that isn't spoken about except in derogatory terms of you're going too fast or you're not going fast enough, but that's the speed at which you do something. And different individuals, the same way they have their rate of breath, that's going to be individual to them. Their internal rhythm is something that you need to start to find, because if you're like a little bunny rabbit and you like to do everything fast and that's okay and you get a long way during your atms pretty quickly that's great that's your speed but somebody else their internal rhythm the way they like to walk through life is going to be theirs and you have to find a way to start to feel what that is and you'll know you're finding it when the movement gets easier if you go too fast then somebody's going to rebel neurologically and say, uh-uh. And if you go too slow, they may just be like, I don't hear you. You're not there, right? Mm -hmm. And then the last one, which is really, really important as well, is the trajectory. Because you can take the shoulder like that. You could take the shoulder like that. You could take the shoulder like that. So where in all of those places to take the shoulder is their easiest trajectory? And that's more like the Ouija board. You know, if anybody's ever played with a Ouija board and it just seems to mysteriously, I'm not gonna make any judgments here. Mysteriously, it just starts to move on its own. And we can talk about what that actually is, in my opinion, that doesn't have to do with spirits later on. But it's that sense of something's moving you, right? And that's how you know you're in the right trajectory. Mm, beautiful. Okay. Thank you. Could you talk a little bit about the format of the workshop, what you're planning for the two days and um, yeah, anything people should know? Well, of course, we're going to start with some ATM because everybody would rebel if we didn't have some ATM in an FI workshop, but the ATMs will be uh, mirror images of the FIs that we're going to do. The first day, we'll start with ATM and we'll go through some FI demonstrations and then trading, of course. Enough time for plenty of questions and answers because that's when everybody gets their, their piece that they personally need to get from a workshop. And we're also going to have a person from the public come in, somebody that is an acquaintance from another part of my life, but they have never had a functional integration lesson. And I will demonstrate on that person for whatever it is that they want, but I will limit myself to the tools that I've been teaching. And the other thing that I want to address within the two days is just that, is that how, no matter what it is that a person comes in with, you can affect change through the use of these techniques that I'm going to share with you of using the spine and the eyes in combination. So whether it's a broken wrist or a sore back or a stiff neck, I'll show you how you can use working with the eyes and working with the spine to affect any of those. Wow, great, exciting. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna start here.
You take your eyes to the right. Eyes to the right. Eyes. So you just do it each time I move your spine a teeny bit. Out. Again, eyes to the right, eyes to the right. Okay. Got a lot lighter and the rotation in the whole hip joint. So this is where I start to think about using this powerful combination of the eyes and the spine to support the movement of the limbs and the power in the limbs. So an important thing here is you also want to think of the trajectory as of the sets moving relative to the ones above and below. So the lower I go, the more I go in a right towards a right angle in the spine. And then the higher I go, the more the angle closes and I'm going more towards a diagonal angle, the higher I go in the thoracic spine. And so then you're, the, you're underneath? I'm underneath the spinous process, right? I'm using the keyhole or the, the way you hold a key in your hands when you're turning a key in a lock. The surface that's supporting is this, this joint, this knuckle and the pad of my thumb. But I change you can see my angle here is like that. And my angle here, the elbow, you see my forearm is pointed more in the direction that that vertebrae, that particular part of the spine is gonna move relative. And then when I get up towards the cervical, again, it's more, in a straight forward. So that's an important thing to remember that the different vertebrae are going to move in different angles. But of course, just as if you're following a Ouija board leading you, you're letting the way this person, this individual wants the vertebrae to move. You're just applying a little bit of an idea of directionality for that relative movement of the one in between its upstairs and downstairs neighbor. Ask for the eyes to move. 
and you time it with the breath. You watch and see when somebody inhales and exhales. And then you come back to the limb. I don't think it will have gotten any easier because he doesn't have a brain. Oh, it did get easier. The miracle of plastic. <laughs> 